chapter nine of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the shadow mrs cheyne's farmhands and stablemen came running and took the horses of those who dismounted and mrs cheyne after examining herself to see that no bones were broken led the way stiffly but without assistance to the house camilla still a little bewildered saw mackinaw led off to the stable for a rub-down the master of the hounds was the first to congratulate her here is your brush mrs ray you've filled every woman's heart with envy to be in at the death of the old chelton fox is an achievement you had a fall are you injured i believe not she said mackinaw is a darling i hope he's sound she inquired anxiously as a bell he said generously he's got the heart of an ox you know he laughed and whispered i bought him from mrs cheyne and to-day you vindicated me others came up men of the hunt club and asked to be presented and camilla enjoying her triumph followed the party to the house mrs cheyne's house differed in character from that of the janeys it was snugly built in a pocket of the hills facing to the south the original building square and massive dated from the early eighteenth century but two symmetrical wings at the sides had greatly increased its original size large pillars and a portico gave the graceful lines which the addition demanded the wide stair hall which ran from front to back had not been altered and the furniture and hangings rigidly preserved the ancient atmosphere the surprised butler and his assistant hurriedly prepared hot scotches and toddy and the halls and large rooms on the lower floor were soon filled with the swaggering company all talking at once each with his tale of luck or misfortune it was not until camilla was gratefully enthroned in a big chair by the open fireplace that cortland bent found a chance to speak to her what possessed you camilla you rode like a demon you've dragged poor rita's pride in the mire riding is her long suit she is not used to yielding her laurels as she did to-day i fancy she's not at all happy about it why asked camilla wonderingly you don't know rita as i do she runs things out here pretty much in her own way he chuckled quietly good lord but you did put it over her i'm sorry if she feels badly about it she put in mendaciously there's nothing to be sorry about you won out against odds on a horse she'd thrown into the discard that doesn't make her feel any sweeter she's a queer one there's no telling how she'll take things but she doesn't like being the underdog and she won't forget this soon neither will i said camilla smiling to herself she scored one on me yesterday but i fancy our accounts are about even yes they are i suppose there's no use warning you no there isn't court i fancy i'll be able to look out for myself he examined her keenly and realized that she was looking at jeff who stood with some men at the end of the room toasting their hostess he seemed to have forgotten camilla's existence in the field before they came into the house jeff had spoken to her and when janey had given camilla the brush jeff had congratulated her noisily with the heartiness and enthusiasm he always showed over things which reflected credit on himself in their private life jeff still stood a little in awe of camilla he realized that his many deficiencies put him at a disadvantage with a woman of her stamp and no matter what he felt he had never asked more of her in the way of companionship than she had been willing to give him ungrudgingly he was tolerant of her literary moods her music her love of pictures and the many things he could not understand she was the only cultured woman he had ever known and his marriage had done little to change his way of thinking of her camilla 
had not meant to abide for ever in the shrine in which jeff had enthroned her in the earlier days of their married life she had been willing to sit enshrined because it had been the easiest way to conceal the actual state of her own mind because it had come to be a habit with her and with him to behold her there their pilgrimage to new york had made a difference it was not easy for camilla to define it just yet he was a little easier in his ways with her regarded her inaccessibility a little less seriously and questioned by his demeanor rather than by any spoken words matters which had long been taken for granted by them both he had made no overt declaration of independence and in his way gave her opinions the same respect he had always given them the difference if anything had been in the different way in which they viewed from the very same angle the great world of affairs men as jeff had always known were much the same all the world over but curiously enough he had never seen fit to apply any rule to its women it was flattery indeed for him to have believed for so long that because camilla was cultured all cultured women must be like camilla his wife realized that jeff's discovery of mrs cheyne was requiring a readjustment of all his early ideas and so while she spoke lightly of mrs cheyne to cortland bent in her heart she was aware that if the lady took it into her pretty head to use jeff as a weapon she might herself be put upon the defensive it seemed as though cortland had an intuition of what was passing in her mind if there's any way in which i can be of service he ventured oh yes court she laughed i'll call on you the only thing i ask of you now is not to fall in love with mrs cheyne rita i'd as soon think of falling in love with a kaleidoscope besides but she laid restraining fingers on his arm tell me about gretchen she interrupted quickly there's nothing to tell except he said with a sigh that she's quite gone on larry you can't mean it really she told me so camilla glanced toward the hall where the two young people were sitting in the big haircloth sofa engaged in a harmless investigation of the science of palmistry camilla laughed it really looks so doesn't it i am sorry though i had begun to look on miss janey as one of the solutions of our difficulty there isn't any solution of it not that way you must take my word for it gretchen and i understand each other perfectly if i can do anything to help lawrence berkeley with her i'll do it oh you're quite hopeless court she sighed and i have no patience with larry i can't see why he doesn't mind his own business bent glanced at the young couple in the hall he seems to me to be doing that tolerably well he leaned forward so that his tone though lowered could be heard distinctly there is another solution perhaps you had not thought of it she turned her head quickly and searched his face for a meaning for reply he coolly turned his gaze in the direction of jeff and mrs cheyne who had withdrawn into an embrasure of one of the windows a solution she stammered yes a way out for both of us you mean jeff and mrs cheyne she whispered i do the poison of his suggestion flowed slowly through her mind like a drug which stimulates and stupefies at the same time you mean that i should allow jeff that i should connive in his she stopped horror-stricken oh court that was unworthy of you she whispered i mean it they're well met those two he finished viciously camilla held up her fingers pleadingly don't speak i forbid you and rising she took up her gloves and cropped from the table besides she said more lightly i have a suspicion that you are trying to stir up a tempest in a teapot 
do you mean you haven't noticed he insisted at my father's at the warringtons last night at the janeys no she replied carelessly i hadn't noticed curtis janey who had been moving fussily from one group to another came forward as he saw camilla rise i was hoping we might still get another short run but i suppose you're too tired mrs ray a little but don't let me interfere i think i can find my way back he looked at his watch hello it's time we were off anyway the other guests will be eating all our breakfast come court gretchen mrs cheyne you know you're my guest still strolling from group to group and ruthlessly breaking up the tete-a-tete so successfully that rita cheyne rebelled you're a very disagreeable person mr janey ivy wilde resents it you're trying to form the hospitality of the county into one of those horrid trusts every time accident throws the hunt my way you insist on dragging it off to braybank it isn't fair of course if you insist and then crossing to camilla dear mrs ray i'm borrowing your husband for a while i feel a little tired so he promised to lunch with me here and go on to braybank later you don't mind do you not in the least my dear mrs cheyne i'm so sorry you feel badly and then to her husband remember jeff mr janey expects you later each spoke effusively the tips of their fingers just touching then mrs cheyne followed her visitors to the door outside a coach horn was blowing and as they emerged upon the porch the janey brake arrived tooled by the coachman and bearing aloft mrs rumson general bent and gladys who had arrived from town on the morning train but they would not get down and the cavalcade soon wound its way along the drive leaving jeff and mrs cheyne waving them a good-bye from the steps camilla took the road thoughtfully it was the first time in their brief social career that jeff had not consulted her before he made his own plans she did not blame him altogether for she knew that jeff's inexperience made him singularly vulnerable to the arts of a woman of the type of mrs cheyne who for want of any better occupation in life had come to consider all men her lawful prey camilla knew that mild flirtations were the rule rather than the exception in this gay world where idle people caught at anything which put to flight the insistent demon of weariness and boredom and she discovered that it was a part of the diversion of the younger married couples to loan husbands and wives to satisfy the light fancy of the hour all this was a part of the fabric in which she and jeff were living and endangered society only when the women were weak and the men vicious but jeff somehow didn't seem to fit into the picture his personality she had learned to associate with significant achievements his faults as well as his virtues were big and he had a habit of scorning lesser sins the pleasure of a mild flirtation such as his brothers of the city might indulge in for the mere delight of the society of a woman would offer nothing to jeff who was not in the habit of doing anything mildly or by halves camilla knew him better than mrs cheyne did of course no one thought anything of his new interest in mrs cheyne all of the younger men were interested in mrs cheyne at one time or another and it was doubtful if people had even noticed his attentions cortland had but there was a reason for that anything that could discredit jeff in her eyes was meat and drink to him but it was cruel of cortland to take advantage of her isolation but how could she cut herself off from court 
when her husband by the nature of the situation had thrown her so completely on his mercies it seemed as though all the world was conspiring to throw her with the one man whose image she had promised her conscience she would wipe from her heart he rode beside her now remorselessly proving by his silence more eloquently the measure of his appreciation of the situation she felt that he too was entering the valley of indecision with the surer step of a dawning hope while she faltered on the brink of the slough of despond they had fallen well behind the others and followed a quiet lane bordered by a row of birch trees which still clung tenaciously to the remnants of their autumn finery at one side gushed a stream fed by the early snows which sang musically of the secrets of earth and sky there was no indecision here every twig every painted stone the sky and breeze spoke a message of blithe optimism all was right with the world and if doubt crept into the hearts of men it was because they were deaf to the messages of nature the spell of its beauty fell on camilla too and she found herself smiling up at cortland bent there were many things to be thankful for are you happy he asked one can't be anything else on a day like this you don't care then for what oh yes i have a natural interest in the welfare of my husband but i think mrs cheyne is wasting her time i think perhaps you underrate her he muttered i'd rather underrate mrs cheyne than underrate myself proudly he was silent for a moment flicking at the weeds with his riding crop mrs cheyne and you have nothing in common camilla he said i'm afraid it isn't in you to understand this crowd the set in which she and i were brought up is a little world in itself the things which happen outside of it are none of its concern it doesn't care it has its own rules and its own code of decency to which it makes its members subscribe it is new york in miniature the essence the cream of its vices its virtues and its follies it lives like that poison ivy along the fence stretching out its tendrils luxuriously in the direction of the sun moving along the line of least resistance it does not care what newer growth it stunts what blossom learns to grow beneath its shade to fade and droop perhaps to wither for lack of air and sunlight and yet there's gretchen she said and you he smiled almost gaily yes there are many gretchens thank god girls with the clean sound vision of their sturdy forebears whose mothers were young when the city still felt the impress of its early austerities and you she repeated his brow darkened and he looked straight before him what i am doesn't matter i was born and bred in this atmosphere isn't that enough it's enough that you survived that you too have a clean vision no that is not true he said sharply i can't see clearly i'm not sure that i want to see clearly not now i won't believe that court back there at her house you said something that was unworthy of you that showed me another side of your nature the dark side like the shadowy places under the ivy i want you to forget that you ever said them that you ever thought them even i can't he muttered savagely i want someone to come between you to make him suffer what i am suffering to place a distance between you which nothing can ever repair someone has already come between us she said gently the one i have in mind is the court bent of mesa city who used to help me gather columbines who rode with me far up the trail to get the last ray of the sunset when the valley below was already asleep in the shadow who shouted my name in the gorge because he said it was sweet to hear the mountains send back its echoes all silvered over with the mystery of the infinite 
who told me of palaces and gardens in lands which i had never seen of the talented men and women who had lived in them who sang to me in the moonlight and taught me to dream don't camilla that was a boy i remember who lived years and years ago when i was rich rich in innocent visions which he did nothing to destroy it was he who gave me an idea that there were men who differed from those i had known before men in whose hearts was tenderness and in whose minds one might find a mirror for one's harmless aspirations toward a life that wasn't all material and commonplace he was my knight that boy thoughtful considerate and gentle he was foolish sometimes but i loved him because his ideals had not been destroyed i lied to you life is a sender she shook her head no you did not lie to me not then later you did when you asked me to come to new york oh i know i can see more clearly now suppose that even now i chose what you call your solution the tangle we've made of things you'd like to see jeff desert me for rita chain so that you could have your own way with me now camilla i was mad then i thought you understood gretchen and i i understand many things better than i did she interrupted you were no more mad then than you are now i think i have always been willing to forgive you for that i wanted to forgive you because i thought perhaps you didn't know what you were saying but you make it harder for me now the boy i knew in the west is dead cortland in his place rides a man i do not know a man with a shadow in his eyes a man of the gay world which moves along the line of least resistance with little room in his heart for the troubles of the woman he once offered to protect with his life i would still protect you that is what i am offering how by making me a woman like rita cheyne who changes her husbands as though they were fashions and parasols you offer me protection from jeff i refuse it and then she added a little haughtily i'm not sure that i need any protection he glowered toward her searching her face sullenly you love him he muttered she smiled a little proudly i can't love you both jeff is my husband you love him he repeated answer me not when you take that tone i'll answer you nothing come we'd better ride forward and before he could restrain her she had urged her horse into a canter camilla he called but before he could reach her she had joined the others outside the gates of braybank End of chapter nine